I am back. I have my voice back. Thank goodness. So welcome to my blog. So this was written a while ago, but I didn't have the voice to record it. So now I'm here and I'm here and ready to record. So welcome to my messy studio. February and March mean seed starting and spring peaking tentatively around the corner. This has me thinking about 16th century botanical illustration. If you've never heard of 16th century botanical illustration, uh, that's totally cool because it's an exceptionally specific topic. And you get to learn all about why I love it today. Plus, there will be a little bonus interlude into the early 1900s at the end, so stay tuned. Before photos, artists were the next best thing. The 1400s brought the printing press, and the 1700s brought the Age of Enlightenment. The two together brought about a yearning to create and share each other's knowledge, and some of that knowledge was all about plants. Plants have always been a big deal. Plant power is not new. This Enlightenment period was a mix of backyard enthusiasts and accredited scholars joining together in the delight of sharing what they know, giving us the birth of scientific botany between 1740 and 1840-ish. I am no historian, but I'm doing my best. Typically, botanical illustrations were, and still are, technical, accurate, black and white, and very detailed. Some artists went above and beyond black and whites, and we will look at some of those here. I picked two of my favorite artists to chat about. They are Elizabeth Blackwell and George Errett. I'm not sure how to say that, but I'm going to go with Errett. Plus, there's a little bonus 20th, 20th century nugget at the end, too, but uh, her name's a secret for now. Let's chat about Elizabeth Blackwell first. She lived in London, England from 1699 to 1758, and her father was a painter. After she got married, her husband was sent to jail, and she used her art skills to eventually bail him out. Blackwell created 250 extremely technical engraved plate prints, which she put together into a book called A Curious Herbal in 1737. Her work was so technical and accurate that she ended up working with doctors to help them spread medical uses of plants and the identification of their poisonous counterparts. If you have no idea what I meant by engraved plate prints, uh, I got you. Remember talking about the printing press at the beginning? Well, old printing presses used essentially huge stamps to create books. Blackwell drew her pieces on paper, transferred them onto, usually copper, plates, then hand carved them out. These were then inked, warmed up and stamped onto thick, dampened paper, and then she would hand paint color onto them when they were dry. A painstaking amount of work with a beautiful result. Her 250-page book took years to create, but you can still buy a modern copies of it today. That work paid off when Blackwell paid her husband's debts, allowing him to be released from prison. Two of my personal favorites by her are her canola and dandelion prints. How very Alberta of me. George Errett is the other 1700s botanical illustrator I'd like to ramble on about today. He was from Germany, but spent the later half of his adult life in London, England as well. He lived from 1708 to 1770, and his father was a gardener. Errett was a gardener from 1728 to 1733-ish, too. As someone who is also switching careers, I always feel so comforted when I'm reminded that people have always been saying, oh, actually, nope, not for me, and changing their career path since forever. Anywho, career choices aside, George mostly painted directly onto something called vellum. Now, hold your hats if you love animals, or skip a sentence or two, about 30 seconds, if uh, animal goods bug you. Vellum is usually made from the hide of a young goat or a young cow. It was then treated and essentially bleached, stretched, and cured. Being made from something fauna, vellum is, has collagen in it, making it super smooth and incredibly durable. Most constitutions were, slash are, still on vellum today because it's so durable. Imitation vellum, also sometimes called Japanese vellum or plant vellum, came in the late 1800s as far as I can tell. If you're interested in paper like I am, my next blog is on a special type of paper that I personally adored, no animal hide required. All right, back to Eric. He created a book called Systema Natura, and his gardening background also led to his very detailed artwork, but he also added Latin descriptions and dissections into his works. 
And one of his most famous paintings is of a flowering magnolia tree. Quote, Eret observed the magnolia grandiflora flowering on August 1737. Eret traveled every day from Chelsea to observe all the different stages from bud to full flower. End quote. From the Botanical Arts and Artists about George Dionysus Earhart. His magnolia painting and his fig tree painting are my two personal favorites. So why do I love 1700s botanical illustration so much? I have loved both science and art my whole life. Often people will say the two interests are at odds with each other, but I disagree. The answer I always give is that if I want to accurately draw an arm, I should know the basics of what bones do and how the muscles underneath the skin move for me able to draw it. 1700's botanical illustration is one of the many times that science and art have married one another beautifully. A modern version of this might be medical illustrators, paleo artists, or technical illustrators. Plants are one of my favorite subjects to paint, and I'll include some of my pieces, both finished and in progress, here too. I also love taking a chapter from the 1700s botanical illustration book by sometimes including the Latin and common names for whatever I'm painting. I tend to make a sketch with India ink and then use acrylic or watercolor on top of that. Much to my delight, there has been a huge resurgence in the general public's interest in houseplants. During the lockdowns of 2020 plus, lots of people discovered the joy in taking care of both gardens and houseplants. There's even a new bo edition of Blackwell's book published in 2023. A link is in the works cited if you're interested. People have had a huge reinterest in things like terrariums, herbariums, and orchid culture. And books have been published with botanical illustration like motifs in them, like in Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. There's even a huge rediscovery of the solar punk genre, which is a topic for another blog, but trust me, it's super cool. Finally, here's the much promised 20th century nugget I wanted to include in this blog, the wonderfully talented Beatrix Potter, who was part of the 1900s, not the 1700s, and lived from 1866 to 1945. Do you love mushrooms? I don't mean just to eat, but to look at and to appreciate. I love fungi because it's enigmatic. Fungi is neither a plant nor an animal, but its own little in-between category. They also have these intricate and lace-like underground mycelium roots that look like a nervous system. Well, Beatrix also appreciated fungi and created many scientific papers and beautiful illustrations about it in her lifetime. These were mostly published through England's Linden Society, which operates today. I linked one of their lectures on Beatrix Potter in the works cited. It's a great lesson, and it dives more into her background and her works. In her lifetime, quote, Beatrix wrote about fungi spores for England's illustrious linen society in 1870, or 1897, but a male scientist had to submit the paper on her behalf, end quote, from Frege Fantastic Fungi's The Mycology Adventures of Beatrix Potter. Regardless, she still hailed for her, was hailed for her attention to detail and incredible accuracy. In fact, Quote, to this day, Potter's remarkable fungi illustrations are studied for their scientific accuracy and consulted by many mycologists all over the world. End quote, Pavova Maria. All this being said, you might have recognized her name because she was also the author and illustrator of the famous children's series, Peter Rabbit. Thanks for reading or listening. Be curious and kind.